While we were in Minnesota after Christmas visiting Steph's family, uh, we had a lot of time and a smart TV. And we decided that uh, since the new Matrix movie was coming out, we are going to watch all three of the old ones in preparation. And if you're not a Matrix fan, I apologize in advance. But I was watching that first movie, uh, remembering how much that I liked it. You remember um, Keanu Reeves plays computer programmer Thomas Anderson, who is approached by this mysterious figure, Morpheus. <coughs> Morpheus believes that Anderson, who goes by the handle Neo, is the one. The figure who has been prophesied to end the war between the humans and the machines and free everyone who's trapped in the Matrix. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the movie, it's great. <laughs> I don't think there's any spoilers considering this movie is 20 years old this year. Actually, it's 23 years old. So I'd almost forgotten how much I liked that first movie in particular. They're all real head trips, but that first one in particular has all these great uh, philosoph philosophical and religious themes in it, um, including the nature of cause and effect. So at one point, Morpheus takes Neo to the Oracle, who is this figure who uh, knows everything and can see the future. And she is the one who can tell Neo whether or not he is the one, right? So while visiting with the oracle in her kitchen, she says to him, don't worry about the vase. At which point he goes, what vase? And turns around and knocks a vase over and it shatters on the floor. <laughs> What's really gonna bake your noodle later on, she says, is would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? The oracle goes on to tell Neo that sadly he is not the one, just another ordinary guy. But of course, by the end of the movie, it becomes apparent that Neo is, in fact, the one, and he does exactly what he was prophesied to do. So in the context of the vase incident, we, the audience, are left to wonder if the Oracle didn't so much lie to Neo as she told him what he needed to hear. If she had told him differently, we wonder, would he have responded differently? Would he still have been able to live into his identity as the one in the same way? So why am I talking about the Matrix? I think of this moment with Neo and the Oracle as I read this gospel story today because although Luke has more action than any of the other three gospels previous to this story, this story of Jesus' baptism is the defining moment when Jesus' ministry begins. This is Neo's moment in the kitchen. It is at this moment when everything is set in motion what will, that will determine what follows in the story to come. And when this voice comes from heaven, when the oracle, as it were, speaks, this is the message that Jesus needs to hear. Everything else that Jesus is or says or does in the rest of the story comes from this fact, that he is God's beloved son with whom God is well pleased. One of the lingering questions in this story is why Jesus goes to be baptized at all. This baptism that John offers is, after all, for the re repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, something we are led to believe Jesus does not need. And yet, in his com it is in his coming up out of the water and praying that the Spirit descends on him and he hears this voice. What I can't help but notice is that in this story, just as Luke frames the heavenly voice in the context of Jesus' baptism, Jesus' baptism is itself framed in the context of all these other people who are being baptized. The dove doesn't descend on Jesus at his baptism. The dove descends on Jesus at his baptism at all of these other baptisms. When all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, that's when the Spirit comes and when the voice speaks. It seems to me that Luke is making an explicit connection between Jesus' baptism and all the other baptisms. In the tradition of the church, we have understood this connection to mean that we not only share in Jesus' life through his baptism, but that we also share in his relationship with God. That just as he is God's beloved son, so we also are God's beloved sons and daughters and children. 
And so I wonder, as this voice speaks, as it tells Jesus what he needs to hear, can we also understand that that voice is speaking to us as well, telling us what we need to hear? In the movie, Neo bases his decisions and choices on what he hears in the Oracle's apartment. Morpheus at one point sacrifices himself to save Neo, believing that he is the one, and Neo decides that he's going to rescue Morpheus because he believes Morpheus' sacrifice was in vain. It's in that rescue attempt and what follows, in his desire to save his friends, that Neo comes to realize who he is. Not because somebody told him so, but because of what he's able to do. Had he believed that Morpheus had made the right decision, would he still have gone after him? Would he still have done what he needed to do in order to become the one? Apart from the questions of cause and effect, the movie also explores the concept of identity. Throughout this story, Neo's identity morphs and changes. At the beginning, he is Thomas Anderson, an average guy with an average job. After falling in with Morpheus, he is Neo, a soldier fighting for the survival of humanity. Following his visit to the Oracle, his identity shifts again as he begins to learn who he truly is, not from what he's told, but from what he's capable of doing as he pushes himself to his limits to rescue his friends. Although it's, I would argue, much less dramatic, all of us are making that same journey as Neo every day. As we, dis as we continue to discover who we really are. Our identities, the things that we know and believe about ourselves, guide us on those journeys. Neo's identity as an ordinary person informed his response to Mor Morpheus' sacrifice and led him to the discovery of his true self. In the same way, our identities guide our decisions. We constantly respond to the world according to how we believe we should according to our religious identity, or our gender identity, or our political identity, or any of the other various identities we wear. All of these identities are formed by the world around us. We learn how to behave as women or as men by watching the people around us. We choose which news to believe based on what other like-minded people are believing. We choose and we create these identities for ourselves, and they in turn create us. And that's what's so groundbreaking about this gospel story. Just as in the beginning when the voice of God resounded in the darkness and spoke light into being, here at the Jordan, that same voice speaks once again and speaks into reality this identity for Jesus. This identity which will frame all of the decisions and the choices that he will make from there on. The identity as beloved and pleasing. I can't help but notice that the identities we wear so often do the opposite. They convince us that we are lovable or acceptable only if and when we fit the way those identities think we should. We're only good Christians so long as we believe certain things about God or do certain things for our neighbors. Real men don't, be, don't behave in a way that's too feminine. And women who behave too much like men in certain ways can get labeled bossy or loose or butch. I notice that these days, identity is even formed around whether or not people wear masks or choose to be vaccinated. Those things lead us to infer all kinds of different things about one another, don't they? As I look at the world, I see people trying very hard, like Neo, to live into our identities, into who we think we ought to be. I see us wrestling with what it means when we uh, do or fail to do something that makes us question our identity, question whether or not we are that. I see in the world, I see this in the world because I see it in myself. So much of my stress in my call as a pastor 
is worrying that I'm not doing enough, that I'm not providing enough leadership, that I'm not communicating effectively, that I am not reading or learning or growing or praying enough, that I'm not proclaiming the good news well enough. As I reflect on that, I, re- I realize that it all comes down to this fear somewhere deep inside that I myself am not enough, that you all deserve someone better up here, someone with more experience, more skill. You deserve a better pastor than me. I share this because I see that same worry and that same fear in this congregation as well. As we consider our own ministry, as we think about how we share the good news in our neighborhood or how we face the prospect of a budget deficit, I hear the same questions expressed over and over and over again. We collectively worry that we are not enough, that we aren't doing enough, that we don't have enough, that we can't be enough. And the worried questions about how we will invite our neighbors into this community. I hear us expressing our doubts about whether we are qualified or capable of talking about our faith or whether this is a community anybody would want to be a part of. As we discuss our budget, I can't help but notice that we always start from the assumption that there simply isn't enough to go around. When we talk about what our congregation should be doing in the community, Beneath that loving concern for our neighbors, I can often detect the quiet desperation of people who feel like we are failing. We are afraid of what it means to fail. Even if we're not afraid that God is going to condemn us to hell or punish us for our shortcomings, we are still afraid that we cannot live up to that name of Christ that we bear. That maybe this identity as God's people is not really ours. That maybe we're not the ones. But St. Luke's story today says otherwise. It says that we are not beloved or pleasing to God because of what we do or don't do. What we believe, where we worship. But because God first chooses to love and be pleased by us. That's why we're here, because God has made that choice, and God continues to make that choice, not because of or in spite of who we are, but because of who God is. Child of God is not an identity that we have to live up to. It's a reality spoken into existence by the same voice that created light and life themselves. Neil had a hard time accepting who he was because he didn't feel capable of doing what he was told he had to do. It wasn't until he realized that it wasn't something that he had to achieve, but simply a function of who he was, that he became the one. And I wonder today if the same isn't true for us. The rest of the world tells us that our value is in what we achieve, what we accomplish. And so it's just natural that we should think that God works the same way. But the mystery is that God somehow reverses the order. Like the oracle, God tells us here at this font what we most need to hear. The truth of who we are. And it is that truth that creates the outcome that God desires, not our striving for it. I wonder if our call as Christians is not to make the world a better place, not to bring about the kingdom of God, as we so often suppose, but simply to trust that God is telling us the truth about who we are, that we really are the ones whom God loves the ones in whom God is well pleased. Rather than our ending point, this is our beginning. 
This is where the story starts. The question, the one that'll really bake your noodle later on, is what that means we're capable of moving forward.